quick introduction. Uh, I'm Marcus, working in developer relations for HP, for WebOS. No, no jokes, please. But actually, uh, all the WebOS apps are written with HTML5 technology, so it's uh, quite fitting. So uh, let's go back in time a bit for some history, which is always interesting. OK, we don't go back that far. We go back that far, and it, depending how old you are, uh, you might remember the times where uh, computers were, were like this, right? And TVs uh, were like this. And phones uh, were like this. What has, ha what has happened since then is convergence. So today, you work on your phone, and you play games on your TV, and you talk on your computer. So everything comes together. Then you have all those uh, different devices, from desktops to tablets to phones to TVs to car entertainment systems. It's nice to have so many uh, devices. And you have all kinds of operating systems on those different devices. That's nice, too, unless you're a developer, because then uh, you're pretty much screwed, because you have to develop it for every OS or form factor again. But think of it. Uh, the web is already on all those systems. I think uh, pretty much every device these days has a web browser. And not to display documents like in the early web, but the web is actually turning into an application platform or a runtime. So HTML5, then. Everyone says, yeah, yeah, I know that's ready probably 2020 because it's just a draft and everyone's working on it. And yeah, that doesn't work. But actually, uh, HTML5 is ready today and can be used. Well, obviously, that's why I'm giving this talk. So what is HTML5? Well, if you ask 10 different people, uh, you'll get 10 different answers because there's no, can't quite grasp it. You could say, OK, HTML5 is actually the next version of HTML plus CSS3 plus JavaScript. Then someone else says, no, it's much more. So it's actually much more. Uh, and next, I'm going to talk about all those bits that belong to HTML5. Not the standard, but uh, the set of technologies that we would say is HTML5. So let's start with uh, offline and storage. You might have used uh, local storage. So in your browser, you can uh, have set items and get items value key and value, basically, to store data, which is OK for some uses. But you can also use uh, an SQL database with WebSQL, where you use the well-known uh, SQL. And it's based on uh, SQLite on most platforms. Some people were not happy about uh, WebSQL because it's too much SQL, because it's too old. So they said, no, let's do something new, indexed DB, which is more, let's store uh, JavaScript objects in a database. So depending who, 
who you ask. Uh, someone says, I'm going to use this because I know, know SQL, and someone else says, no, I'm using objects anyway. Let's use index DB. And depending on the browser or the platform, either this or that is implemented. So that's still a bit of a fight. And in that example, you can also see uh, that HTML5 is still in evolving. It's no uh, fixed set of technology. Uh, if you want to use web applications offline, there's the application cache where you can say, keep all those files on my machine. If you unplug the cable, you can still uh, access those files. If you have any questions, just uh, interrupt me and let me know. Then the next part uh, of technology is real time and connectivity. The first one, I think you uh, also mentioned it, web workers, so that you can actually have background processing or multi-threading. So uh, you can have multiple workers that complete the task. Here, you see some code, how you create that. And they, the different threads uh, talk to each other through messages. So you say, please, worker, do that work, and let me know when you're finished. And since the browser is, is single-threaded, this is the only way to have some kind of uh, multi-threading. Then you also have web sockets because if you want to do everything uh, over HTTP, you have real-time communication over HTTP is probably uh, the normal way is too slow. With web sockets, you can connect directly and have bidirectional communication between two systems. So that's pretty handy. So you open a connection and send back back and forth messages. Pretty easy. Uh, next part is harder access. Usually the browser is sandbox and you don't have any possibilities to get to any hardware. Geolocation, which is more or less implemented in all the systems, you can say, please get me the current position of that device through GPS, through Wi-Fi, whatever, in the background. Uh, with dev device orientation, you can find out how is my device, is it turned on the side, is it up, is it up, usually through an accelerometer, or interesting enough, on some notebooks through, through the accelerometer that's built into the hard disk, it's usually used uh, if, your, if your notebook falls down, then it senses that acceleration and uh, prepares the head for a crash. You can use that accelerometer to find out if how your device is moving. So you can you can have you basically have an accelerometer even on your PC and not uh, only on the phones. So that's pretty interesting. That you get orientation events into your application uh, through this API. You can also see there is a standard on the work by the W3C, the device API, that you can add more sensor because all the mobile phones add more and more sensors, gyro sensors, light sensors, who knows what sensors. So that the idea is that uh, all the access to all those sensors is standardized. And you can also see with projects uh, like PhoneGap, they are also trying to uh, provide a uh, a common set to access uh, device sensors, among other stuff. Also, again, this is one, that's a standard that's still evolving. HTML5 is actually, one part of HTML5 is actually the HTML that we used to, to do documents, so they added some stuff there as well in the markup. 
So you can uh, add a structure to your documents. Say this is a footer, this is a header, this is an article or a section, or this is the navigation, instead of just using diffs and different classes. It even includes microdata, so that in your document you can have machine readable parts. Because if you just display text in the document, you don't know what it, this is if a, if a machine reads this. And with microdata, you say, this is like this. Here we say, this is an item type of product. And then the text is just brand Bridgestone. But if you add this span, if you add this item prop brand, then it knows oh, this text is actually a brand. So a machine can read that and build a catalog of your markup. Then you also have new form types, not only password, but more stuff. You can say, oh, this input is required. This input is an email address or a telephone number or a color selection. You might think that's, hmm, why should you use that? But if you think uh, on mobile phones that have uh, virtual keyboards, you can, uh, the browser there can actually decide, depending on the type of input, what kind of uh, keyboard to display. So if, if the input type is a telephone number, then it will only show the numbers. Or if the input type is email, then uh, one of the keys will be the, the add key. So that makes sense. A big part of HTML5 is uh, improved graphics and multimedia. So we can play audio in the browser without any plugins. You can play videos in the browser without plugins. Or also uh, mentioned in Yulan's talk, Canvas. Uh, 2D, a method to uh, display 2D graphics. So you define uh, a canvas element has a certain uh, width and height. Then you start to uh, paint on that canvas. In this example, you say, let's. Uh, Fill a rectangle with color and then play, uh, let's display an arc or lines. And as you saw in PDF.js, you can go pretty far with that. Some, t some 2D games uh, are using Canvas because uh, you can get a pretty high frame rate. Let's see. I think I have a good demo here. I don't think there is any sound. So no more. That's all canvas in the browser. Yeah. Silly, but there are other examples like, uh, I think there is even a NES simulator and all kinds of crazy stuff. <laughs> and the syntax is pretty easy. Uh, Display a line, display a rectangle, display an image, cool stuff. Crazier stuff is uh, actually Canvas 3D with WebGL. And you go uh, much farther. That's uh, pretty impressive. Stuff like that uh, runs in your browser. It's basically OpenGL for your browser. SVG. It's 
scalable images without any plugins. Well, SVG was uh, possible before in the browser, but with all kinds of crazy plugins. Also, a big part of HTML5 is CSS3. For example, uh, the presentation software that runs in the browser I'm using is a lot, using a lot of CSS3. The CSS part of CSS3 brings new selectors so that you can, uh, in a table, sell, uh, mark the end, uh, the end child of your table, for example, mark or even rows mark all odd uh, rows, mark the first child of your element, stuff like that. Makes your life easier. Web fonts were mentioned before, again, so that you can uh, use true type fonts or open type fonts on your websites and don't have to go back and uh, create images of your fonts. Simple things like uh, Text overflow handling is also included. Columns, which uh, are not that easy with uh, no normal HTML. It's much easier uh, with CSS3. Uh, define colors with opacity. Round the corners. Big whoo. <laughs> not really. But re I mean, go back a few years. <laughs> And uh, remember all the crazy hacks you had to do uh, to have rounded corners in the design. Now you can just say, hey, border radius, done. You can have gradients, all kinds of crazy uh, gradients, and gradients, actually. If you ever saw uh, Leia Viru giving a talk about CSS3, she did some crazy stuff with gradients. So this is actually all uh, made with gradients. You can see the code below. Pretty impressive, I think. So this is uh, down in CSS3 of gradients. Crazy stuff. Shadows for text or shadows for boxes. Well, something simple. The flexible box model is actually something great because uh, with diffs and different viewports, it's pretty hard. Uh, for example, if you try vertical alignments of different uh, boxes. This is much easier with the flexible box model. Transitions are also interesting. This is an example for a transition. Uh, basically, you change, basically, what you do is you change one element. Let's say uh, a box turns from uh, red to blue. If you do that without transitions, it just switches instantly from uh, red to blue. If you use transitions, you can say, okay, please have that transition take one second and uh, it will look much different because it, then it takes one second to switch the color. But you can uh, apply that to all changes to an element. So if you say this box is on the left and now it's on the right, and if it takes two seconds to go from the left to the right, you actually have an animation. Or you can transform elements. You can say rotate my element, scale it, translate it in 3D space, translate it uh, in perspective. And the good thing is this is usually, depending on the platform, hardware accelerated, so it's pretty fast. So if you try to if you try to do animations with JavaScript and CSS, it's usually slow. 
But if you do it with CSS3, it's usually harder accelerated and pretty fast. Some nuts and bolts added in HTML5. Use selectors that you can say, hey, give me all the elements that have that class name, for example. Or give me uh, all the elements that have a certain CSS selector. Custom data attributes are pretty interesting so that you can add your own, own markup, so to speak. So do, to this diff, we add a data ID, a data name. And afterwards, we can uh, access it through the properties of this diff. jQuery Mobile uses that uh, quite extensively, for example. A history API also belongs to HTML5. So the, uh, if you have JavaScript applications that actually change the URL, you don't have to do crazy hacks. You can say uh, with history push, push state, here is the new URL for that page. Or you can listen to any transi transitions in your, if someone presses back or forward in your browser without crazy hacks. So the conclusion of all those technologies, back to the web as an application platform. With those technologies, you can actually build applications using HTML5 today. Of course, you have all kinds of fr frameworks. You probably heard of them, Central Touch, jQuery Mobile, you use Browcore every week or every month brings a new framework. But those are usually using all those technologies that enable you to create applications. And with applications, I don't only mean uh, websites that look like applications, because with tools like PhoneGap or Titanium, two examples, you can have actual, uh, especially on mobile platforms, you can have actual uh, applications that you download from an app store. You start them, but in the background, they're actually running in the browser, but you don't see it anymore. Or these days, you can uh, take, even take your web application, go to services like Apparat or build PhoneGap or Strobe is the newest one and say, please uh, generate me a package for Android, for iOS, for who knows. And with all those technologies, there are open standards. They're usually open source. And there is no vendor that dictates what's going to happen to them. And there are a lot of tools, there are a lot of libraries. Like PDF.js uh, is another example of that. And of course, there are a lot of communities because it's based on open standards and uh, open technologies. Uh, a lot of people talk freely about what they're doing, which is great in my opinion. Any questions? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you can download them. Uh, I'll put it on my website somewhere. No, <laughs> no, you can use them. Uh, the the framework I'm using for the slides is also an open source project, so of course you can use it. Questions. Thank you very much.